Where was your God when I was broken? Where was your God when I was grieving? Where was your God when I was addicted? Your God does not care. Well, there's two words revealed in John chapter 11. But it says this. Well, I like you too, but Jesus loves you more, mate. He loves you more. And he's not indifferent to your pain and your suffering. He's able, mate. He's able. Thank you. Good morning Newcastle, I hope you're well and I know when I first start speaking on the microphone people get a jump, people get a little bit irritated I get it, it's a guy on the microphone in the street wanting his voice to be heard um, but the reason I want my voice to be heard is not to tell you a message about how great I am about the next political move um, to protest as such, I'm not here for that I'm here to share a message which actually is for every single person here Granted, a lot of people will say that message isn't for me. They'll put their fingers in their ears and say, I don't want to hear it. I've heard it all before. But the message is for you because the Bible says, this word of God here says, that the message goes out to all people. So regardless of your colour, your gender, your social status, how much money you've got in the bank account, this message goes out to you today and I pray by the movement of the Holy Spirit that it pierces your heart because really nothing I can say today is going to influence you that much. Nothing I say today is going to be that convincing unless God does something in your life. Unless God grabs hold of this word that myself and my brothers are going to say today and does something and drives it home to your heart, then I'm wasting my time. But if I'm not wasting my time and God does grab hold of this word that I'm saying, then actually your life can be radically transformed because I'm not speaking fairy tales to you here. I'm not speaking feel goods. And it, it might be important to say this, that I'm not speaking emotionalism here today. A lot of people speak emotionalism just to try and woo you and convince you into a state of weakness so you might, you might believe it, or really felt it. Now if you get emotional and you really feel it, praise God, but that is not my intention. But just because I'm not speaking emotionalism here today, that doesn't mean that I'm emotionally devoid. And I find it difficult not to start every message like this when I step out in the city that I love, to the people that I love, don't necessarily know you. But what you can't avoid and what you can't escape Newcastle is that wherever you go, wherever you take your steps and just have a look around here this morning, that there's pain and there's suffering, there's disease and there's death everywhere. It's all over the streets. And then maybe you go home and your life will be full of pain, full of suffering, full of death, full of uncertainty when you look in the mirror, full of confusion. So when a street preacher comes out to the street, ironically, people get up in your face and they shout, your God doesn't care. Your God doesn't care. If he does exist, he's certainly distant. He's not interested in me. Where was your God when? And I guess what I'm saying is, is I look out to the people of this city with compassion, I ask myself, Curtis, where did it come from? And then I realise that my Lord and my Saviour looked out to people with compassion. With compassion. How does Jesus look to you today, Newcastle? He looks to you with compassion. He's not indifferent to your suffering, he's not laughing at your pain. But on the flip side of that, our God is just and holy and righteous. And he is against our sin, he's against our rebellion. He, he, you can't have one side of gospel, you can't just have Jesus loves your message. But it's a beautiful message because despite our rebellion, despite our sin, despite all of the wages of it, 
And what comes with it, Jesus is compassionate to where you are today. It speaks to the humanity of Christ. Do you know that people say, well, where was your God? When did your God prove it? I've never seen him. Do you know that Jesus is documented of being real, alive, all throughout history in the Bible and outside of it, it's confirmed? And not only Jesus was real, but this Jesus that I tell you about Newcastle was God embodied. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then this Word put on flesh, and he dwelt amongst us. Light came into darkness, clean came into dirty. Holy came into unholiness and rebellion. Who is this God? I'm telling you about his name's Jesus. What a wonderful saviour. He did that. He did that. Why did he do that? Because God owes us nothing. I think it's important to understand this, that no matter where you are on the scale, God owes you nothing. Where was God when? He doesn't owe you anything. God didn't do anything for me. He doesn't owe you anything. Where was God when I was drowning and I was in pain? Well, he doesn't owe you anything. But I tell you what, the character of God shows you that right now, he gives you breath. Feel it. He gives you breath. Why? Because the Bible says he's rich in mercy and slow to anger. That his grace is sufficient for you because it's been sufficient for me. The Bible tells us that God is not slow in pouring out his wrath upon all sinful creation, but what it is, is that he's patient. Want you to come to know him. See, what we see here, Jesus Christ, oh no, I don't want him. And he can do that, and he can walk away, but Jesus came down for us, even though we may not want him, he desires a relationship with you. Why does God want something to do with you? Because he does, and he loves you. And it's us that's turned away from him. The humanity of Christ. Where was your God when I was broken? Where was your God when I was grieving? Where was your God when I was addicted? Your God does not care. Well, there's two words revealed in John, chapter 11. Sometimes people debate about this, that it's the shortest verse in the Bible. I don't know if it is. There's some very close. Two simple words that reveal the heart of God, the heart of the Savior. It says, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. So, he do, yeah, he does care. He wept because he cared. Exactly right. He does care. Yeah, Jesus wept because he cared. Now the story of why Jesus wept is found in John chapter 11. Now Jesus is out with his disciples, doing what Jesus does. He's in, in the full flow of his ministry. And Lazarus, his good friend, was sick, really sick, very, very sick indeed. And Martha and Mary, and Lazarus were family. Now, you may well remember in the Bible that Mary was the woman and washed his feet with her hair. What a wonderful display of love and worship towards the Savior. She knew who he was. And so was Martha. And Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus so much they were family. And Jesus was out a day's trip away from where they were doing what Jesus does on, on mission with the disciples. And Martha and Mary, they sent somebody to go and tell Jesus, all, although he already knew, that Lazarus was sick. Lazarus was very sick. He was on his way out. The messenger gets to Jesus. And he says, Lazarus, your friend, your beloved friend is sick. It's not good. And... You know the question, where was your God when I prayed and your God did nothing? Your, I prayed and your God was not on time. I prayed and they still died. You know what happened? Jesus stayed where he was for two extra days. Wait a minute. Jesus' friend who he loves dearly, mate, was desperately sick. The family who he loved dearly was desperately desperate for an answer. They knew who he was. In a moment, Jesus didn't have to go to where they were, but he could have just said the word. 
and they could have been healed. Lazarus could have been up dancing around. He could have said the word. Do you mean that? Jesus didn't intervene in that problem. Not at that time, no, he didn't. And he gives his reasons for it. He says, look, what's about to happen is going to be for the glory of God and all of you disciples are going to see it. All of the people there are going to see something. They're going to see who I am. I'm going to fulfill these scriptures and you will see it. But in the small view that we have, guys, Jesus didn't intervene when they wanted him to intervene. When Jesus eventually turns up, Lazarus had been dead for four days. Do you know what happens to a body when it's been dead for four days? It doesn't smell good. The body starts to decompose internally. So if you die, after 24 hours, within the first three days, your insides, because it's not getting any blood pumped around, it's not getting any oxygen, it starts to decompose from the inside out. That was three days. What happened on the fourth day? Well, after three to five days, the body starts to bloat. All of the gases start to push out under pressure, and that actually pushes blood out of the corpse. It sounds gruesome, I know. But what I'm saying to you is Lazarus was dead. Very, very dead. And he was in the tomb. So when Jesus turns up to Martha and Mary's and where Lazarus used to live, he's met with Martha who runs out and she says, Master, Lord, if you were here, you wouldn't have died. How many times have people in Newcastle said that? In Jewish culture at that time, mourning was a big thing. When somebody died, it wasn't just like a few people went to the funeral and that was it. It was an event. They thought and believed that it wasn't right for somebody to mourn by themselves. So actually, there used to be a profession of a professional mourner. And all of the Jews at the time would come round the, the deceased family and they would weep and they would wail. In Britain, we're quite reserved with our feelings. We don't cry too much. We hardly beat the car horn, do we, sir? We don't like it. But some cultures, when they mourn, they pour out their emotion. The Bible says there are time for everything. There's weeping and wailing. And what did Jesus do? Bearing in mind that he stood before all of these people, weeping, wailing, suffering. Hello, brother, you're right. And Jesus turned up, you know, and he knew what he was going to do. Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus knew, and people knew that Jesus had been doing some stuff. He knew who he was. And Jesus got there amongst all of the grief, amongst all of the, the, the processions, of all of the crying, of all of the pain, of all of the suffering, of all of the wise. And you imagine people would turn up and say, oh, it's all right for you to turn up now, Jesus, he's already gone. And Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Two words, so revealing. Jesus wept. Jesus wept because people were weeping. Jesus, the, the, the compassionate Christ, he's not indifferent. He's not laughing at the suffering. He knows. The Bible says that we do not serve a great high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our sufferings. Jesus wept because the people he knew, the people he loved, were grieving. And not only that, he wept because he saw the results of sin. You've got to remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. In the foundations of the earth, his hands were there. When he was knitting people together, he was there. And then he sees sin rush into this world, and death, and destruction, and pain, and weeping is part of that. And he wept over it. I love you, I love you, brother. Thank you for listening, mate. I all listen right. all the time. All right, mate. All right, brother. Listen, you keep out. You too. Let's we'll be here, there. all right? And keep your eyes on the Lord. I will. I will. Promise? Yeah, promise. Well, I like you too, but Jesus loves you more, mate. <laughs> he loves you more. Thank and he's you. not indifferent to your pain and your suffering. He's able, mate. He's able. Thank you. And you as well, brother. All right? Keep a hold. Then they go to the tomb. So they 
I read the, the processions, the funeral processions, and even the professional mourners looked at Jesus and they said, look how he loved Lazarus. They thought Jesus was weeping because he lost his friend, but this wasn't the case. So they go to the tomb. Martha and Mary take Jesus to the tomb. And bearing in mind, Lazarus had been gone for four days, and we just explained what being dead for four days does to a body. He says to them, open the tomb. Bearing in mind, just before that, he speaks to Martha, and he says, look, did I not tell you? If you believed, you would see the glory of God. If you believed, you would see the glory of God, Martha. If you just remember who I am, you will see the glory of God because I am the resurrection and I am the life. Jesus is claiming to have power over death. And Martha says, Jesus, I know I'll see my brother again. I believe. I believe I'll see him in heaven. I believe that when we die, I'll be with him again. But Jesus says, I, I ain't talking about that. I'm going to do something which is going to bring glory to my Father and let everybody know who I am. I'm going to fulfill the scripture. So he says, open the tomb. But he's been dead for so long, it's good. It, the stench is going to be bad. Open the tomb. So they open the tomb. Jesus turned his eyes to his Father and prayed. Because I know you hear me. But I want everybody else to know that you hear me. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. What happened? Did someone stay dead in the tomb? Was this bloated corpse just dead? Was it a horrible stench? Do you know what there was? Where there once was death, life came forth. How confusing in this life. How can death bring life? You look at the cross. How can death bring life? Come forth, Lazarus. So Lazarus comes forth in his grave clothes. He was once wearing death, but in Christ we have life. Jesus said to them, take off those grave clothes because he was dead, but now he's alive. He doesn't belong to what is dead. He is alive. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus Christ is God. Lazarus, come forth. A new castle. What are we saying to you today? I get that it's painful. I get that in this life we will have suffering. But we can take heart because Jesus Christ has not only overcome the world, but he's overcome the grave. Because Jesus is compassionate. He says he's close to those who draw close to him. See, how can death bring life? The Bible tells us that we are dead in our sins and trespasses. God bless you for that. We are dead in our sins and our trespasses as we stand here. We are the walking dead. Without Christ, we are the walking dead. You may not be in the tomb, but we are walking dead in our sins. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is an eternal life with him. Because in Jesus we can have hope. He's the only one. He's the only one. Jesus' death at the cross was because we could not pay the cost. Just as Lazarus could not raise himself from the dead, we cannot save ourselves. Your religious works is not enough. Your good behavior won't save. We need a savior. Because either somebody pays the cost for us or we're going to pay it. And Jesus gave his life for you at the cross. And you know where else Jesus cried out? He cried out at the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. We don't know as, what we're doing as we mock him. We don't know what we're doing as we live a life that is totally against him. We don't know what we're doing. But Jesus knows and Jesus calls you to himself. Lazarus come forth, he says. And Lazarus burst out of the tomb. I take off those grave clothes, Newcastle. I say this to you before I put this down. He tells you to take off the grave clothes. You can come alive in Christ Jesus. How do you do that? You trust that what Jesus did at the cross is sufficient for you. If you would only believe, you would see the glory of God. 
if you would only believe, you would see the glory of God. And I believe today that we will see the glory of God in the land of the living. And what is the most glorious thing that angels long to look into is how Jesus Christ can save a wretch like me and a wretch is like us. The gospel. See, the angels seen from the beginning. What a terrible situation. How could God, but before the beginning of the foundations of the earth, the Lamb was crucified for the forgiveness of sins because Jesus Christ came to save sinners, which we all are. So I say to you today, it doesn't matter how much grief and how much pain there is. Put your hope in Jesus Christ because the Bible says this light and momentary affliction that we're in when we're in Christ. Because the Bible doesn't promise you wealth, health, and prosperity. It, pros it promises you trials and tribulations. But in that, this light and momentary affliction that we even have when we're in Christ is working for good. The Bible says that there's nothing that we go through. There's not a, a tear that we cry. There's not a persecution that we have. There's not a suffering that is wasted in Christ Jesus because it is stirring up an eternal weight of glory. Light and momentary affliction versus an eternal weight of glory in Christ. Nothing's wasted. So when you're a Christian and you're in Christ, you have a hope. I ask you if you want that hope. I ask you if you want that peace. I ask you, do you want to come alive in Jesus Christ today? Look at the world. Look at it. It's dark. It's vile. It's rebellious. It's disgusting. It's pretty on the outside and disgusting on the inside. What we see is a result of sin. Jesus wept. What we see is we see pain and suffering. Jesus wept. But the Bible says our weeping will turn to joy in Christ Jesus. Our weeping will turn to joy. We will rejoice with him in the kingdom forever because we will see the glory of the Lord. So what you must do is acknowledge that you're a sinner. You're not good and neither am I. But Jesus is. And when we believe upon him and we turn from our sin. See, some people say this. They say, preacher, you shouldn't say the word repentance. You shouldn't say it. You just confirmed it. I definitely should say the word repentance because without repentance, we can't be saved. See, repentance is turning from. Let me illustrate it. I'm walking down the long road of destruction. I'm going to hell. I'm rebelling against God. The Holy Spirit pierces my heart in Newcastle by the preaching of the gospel. Do I continue going down there? Or do I have my mind changed by the Holy Spirit, metanoia, and change direction and go to Christ? See, repentance is turning from and then turning to. Turn from your sin and turn to Christ, and it's a gift, not a work. So Newcastle, repent and believe the gospel, and you will have every reason to have a joy in Christ. God bless you.